So I'm Daniel Svonava. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of Superlink. And uh, Blake, no sugar, nothing straight, Blake. Hey, yo, we are back with another MLOps community podcast. What a doozy this one was talking to Daniel. I got to say before we go anywhere, thank you, Daniel, for being so patient with me. Thank you so much because he explained it to me like I was five. I felt like I was inside that Reddit, subreddit community. <laughs> I had to ask him and re-ask him because I really wanted to make sure that I understand what exactly he is talking about when he mentions vector compute and how it can enhance these different systems that are using vectors and embeddings. And so he broke it down for us and it was a little bit reminiscent of DSPy when I talked to Omar, the creator of DSPy, which by the way, has anybody else noticed that that feels like it's absolutely blowing up? If you are using DSPy in production, hit me up because I would love to hear about your story and what you're doing. I don't know anybody using it in production, but I feel like it's soon, it's coming. And with all the attention that it's getting, it should be happening. But who knows? Especially because the creators and maintainers are university students. So I'm not sure if anyone feels comfortable using it in production yet. But if you are, tell me. Okay, side note, little tangent over. Let's get back to Daniel and the vector compute. This is something that I felt like I needed a metaphor before I understood it. And he broke down the metaphor very nicely. He said, you know what? Think about when you are shooting photos with a DSLR and you get a raw file. That file is not the most beautiful image, but what it has is all of the information contained in that image. So what you're able to do when it comes to tweaking that image is bring out the pieces that you think are best in that image. And the metaphor there is that when it comes to embeddings, throwing them into your vector database, with the vector compute, he wants all of the embeddings to be flattened. And he wants the vector compute to be that piece that allows you to bring out what is most important when it comes to your use case and what you are optimizing for and what you want to show people. So in the case of a recommender system that you want to show people some for you page type stuff, you're going to preference certain features and certain parts, certain embeddings more than others. And when it comes to a RAG system, you're going to preference different embeddings. Now, if that ain't a good metaphor, I don't know what is. I'll let him explain it more. Hopefully, you all aren't throwing things at your screen or phone, whatever you're listening to this on, because it took me so long to understand what the hell was going on. And hopefully, after this, you too are able to understand what is going on. If you end up using Superlinked, let me know. I would love to hear what your experience is with it. If you have strong opinions about why or why you shouldn't use it, I would also love to know that. I know there are opinionated people in the community, and so that's cool too. There, This episode, I want to preference this with, it is not sponsored. I just love Daniel and what he's doing and wish him the best. Go check out Superlinked.com if you get the chance. And also, he is creating Vector Hub. So that's a way for you to compare all of the different vector databases and what their features are. So that's cool because it's basically like non-biased, third party, able to look at all the different vector databases, not just the specific vector databases that are only vector databases, but everything. I mean, everything from the vector database that is something like a Cassandra that bolts on a vector database to like a quadrant, which is only for vector database or vectors. <laughs> oh, I said vector database way too many times in that last sentence. So let's get into the conversation with Daniel. Check it out. Superlinked.vectorhub, I think is what he said, .com. And we'll leave it all links in the description for you anyway. 
And if you enjoy this, if you think that it is worth talking about it more, hit me up or share it with a friend. Let's get into the conversation and I hope you enjoy my new song, Prompt Templates, which you can stream anywhere, especially on Spotify right now. Tell me, man, you went from being a recommender system, basically. What was the V1 idea? And then uh, how did you realize that you needed to pivot? Yeah, it was a it was a journey. I would call it kind of incremental steps to success, not uh, not like full pivot. Um, but many many years ago, we wanted to build a social graph across uh, the internet, right? Kind of a social login, basically. Um, this was kind of uh, you know the COVID was just kicking off, and everybody was online, wanting to connect, scattered across communities. Uh, so we built various apps for professional communities with the eye t- towards shared login and uh, uh, kind of shared user preference model under the hood, right? Uh, I have been at in, in the YouTube ads for six years, so you know user modeling is kind of uh, the particular hammer I have to hit every nail. Um, so so okay, so so that was that was the plan, uh, and then we realized that okay. Um, all kinds of other products want to build personalized experiences, right? Understand what the user wants, give it to them quick, right? Uh, it, you know, around that time, TikTok also came out with the monolith paper where they kind of uh, cemented, uh, you know, some of their ideas into real-time personalization. And uh, our system was kind of structured quite similarly. Um, so that was like the initial validation and you know, we, we kind of opened up the platform and started to onboard people beyond social, like uh, um, jobs, marketplace, and, and an e-commerce company, and, and so on. Um, and then, you know, um, we, we, we raised some money, and the second time we tried to do that, everybody was like, oh, recommend the system as a service. We see that, you know, five times a year. What's so special about this one? And... We had some ideas for how not to be stuck into like a, you know, software consultancy mode, building ranking models, you know, uh, new ones for each client, because that's typically how those companies go, right? You kind of pitch people on a KPI list, and then you go building these these uh, re-ranking models based on uh, the behavior of those uh, specific users in that specific context. We, we didn't want to do that. We wanted the product. And so we off- we basically said, okay, in this whole recommender system stack, you typically have retrieval and ranking, right? And our goal was to basically reduce the need for ranking as much as possible and do it by making the retrieval smarter, right? Um, and we did that by you know, carefully constructing these complicated vector embeddings of both the users and the recommended items and then having our own query language into the vector search vector retrieval um, that would allow you to express all these different objectives that you have when you do recommender systems uh, and even add the behavioral feedback loops on top uh, without building this kind of monstrous uh, re-ranking model. Um, so I'm just wondering, the basically the Rexus as a service feels like when you say it, oh yeah, everybody needs recommender systems and... It should be something that is important to people, but none of it took off because of this consultancy angle or this basically white gloved angle that you have to take. And you realized, okay, if we're going to have to make custom models for everyone, or if we're going to try not to make custom models for everyone, then what can we do to make this easier for us? And presumably that's where you came up with the idea oh wait there's other pieces to the puzzle that are harder problems that maybe we can go it's like you're going a little bit lower down the stack right yeah yeah exactly uh you know by kind of asking ourselves the question of uh can we make the underlying retrievers retrieval smarter right uh we spend a lot of work in the in the you know, vector embedding calculation for these complex data objects. 
Um, and then we realized that just that alone is, is uh, an interesting problem to solve that repeats across many different use cases. Um, and that's where we basically, a couple of years ago, started to build the vector computer, right? Um, you know, kind of as productized as possible way to turn complex data into vector embeddings. Uh -huh. and, and you told me about this before, but basically it's like in software, especially recently, we have vector, well, we have compute and storage. And one thing that has been very, very popular, and it's been almost like a, a boon to software developers is decoupling compute and storage. And right now with vectors, we have vector storage, but we didn't really have anybody that was thinking about vector compute. And judging by how hot the vector space is, it seems like it's ripe for compute now why i guess why is it different than just like regular compute right that's probably like the first question that you got asked by every vc that you tried to raise from on this second time around right 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 so so as you're saying you know the um there is the there is the storage part and uh, uh you know i would also add to that the problem of organization right so building the vector index doing all the things the database has to do, um, sharding, reliability, uh, access controls, right? Um, so so there is a bunch of people working on that. Um, and then, you know, how is the compute different? Uh, at the end of the day, you are spending, you are burning the same electricity running on the same hardware. So at the end of the day, the, the underlying operations are the same. And the name of the game is always about how do you control this thing, right? Do you have, are you building, you know, models from scratch in PyTorch? Are you running uh, data pipelines in, in Spark, right? Are you using this kind of completely generalized uh, computing models uh, to, to solve the problem? Or is it worth thinking about a an abstraction that's specific to turning data into vectors, right? And, and if you basically say, okay, how would that look, right? Like, what, what would be the properties that you want out of such abstraction? Then that's when you start to think about kind of the data engineering problems. How how do you keep things synchronized? How do you do backfills? You think about the machine learning problems. How do I, uh, you know, for complicated data object with million different properties of different types, how do I somehow boil this together and make the vector, right? What's the What's the highest level abstraction that allows me to do that um, but still gives me control, right? So it's not like, oh, I just turn everything to string and then send it to a language model because that's literally the opposite of control, right? So um, how do we do this? Wait, how do we put wait, our why? Well, tell, me, <laughs> tell me more about this turning it into a string because I feel like uh, <laughs> you're talking directly to me that seems like something that a lot of people do. And then what the big biggest problem there is that we can't wait this string in any way, shape, or form. Right, right. So so basically, you know, let, let's take an example, right? You have, uh, let's say, a movie database, and you, you know all kinds of things about your movies, right? Uh, you know, the movie names and the categories and the descriptions. That's the easy stuff. Um, then you know things like viewership popularity, right? You know, specific click patterns of your users that interact with these movies, right? These are all the different signals that uh, you have about the movie. Uh, maybe the launch date, when was it released? Um, right now, when people do RAG and they do uh, recommender systems and, and, and kind of retrieval, unless they train their own, you know, two-tower uh, Rexis model, um, which often still doesn't eat all the data because some of it is just difficult to eat. Um, basically, the, the kind of uh, language model first approach here, right, is to stringify the whole movie, right? So you literally concatenate all the different properties um, and and then you take uh, embedding and the embedding is like, God knows what, right? A uh, thousand floating point hours, right? Uh, 
and and then you know some movies kind of get clustered uh and and some movies are near each other that 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 really shouldn't like you look at it as a you just eyeball right you didn't even get to quantitative tests you just eyeball this thing and there is something weird every once in a while something gets slotted somewhere where it doesn't make sense and then you notice that oh it's picking up about something in the description that sort of like makes it think that it's related to this other thing but but really shouldn't and that's where prompt engineering comes in which is my both most and least favorite part of this um because because people literally start to say like um you know movie name colon movie name comma and then like it is a description but it's not so important but you know fyi colon and then the description right and, and then they like just kind of tweak just how you know um sort of uh, heavy-handed they should be about uh, pre prefacing the description and that's just not a way to build an actual system right um yeah right so so it's really some other way to kind of um put the constraint over it like how do you want to create this pressure to for certain things to be close together and certain things to be far apart in a way that makes sense to your specific problem right so maybe you are all about like freshness right uh recent news right and so then you would want to kind of really boost the the aspect of how long has the news been out right um then and and you know popularity and relevance to your query whatever it is right so we spend a lot of time thinking about ways to express these uh different often competing objectives um and then have the underlying system kind of navigate the trade-off which you know like okay in in you know among us uh, engineers which means basically you know you're putting all these things to the embedding right then you are constructing the search vector to tap into all those different properties of your movie um, and it ha it helps if the thing you index is kind of unit normalized is not biased to any of those signals and then when you search you can create the biases or, or kind of weights different ways to different uh, aspects of the of the vector space um basically so i like this i think the idea here of you saying this is how you can get more control when it comes to dealing with vectors and especially on things like recommender systems or rags where you have all of this data but you don't necessarily know which data is important or you do know which data is important but you don't have a way to explain to the model how oh this data is more important except for through prompt engineering and you never really know if that is working or not and so now yeah. you're saying, if I'm understanding this correctly, with the vector compute, you're able to take all of the different things that the vector or the, the item is made out of. So it is made of a photo and some description and some features about how long people watch the video and the popularity score, whatever. There's metadata, there's the actual title, and there's the images. So you have all these different pieces of the puzzle. And what are you doing with all that information? Exactly, exactly. How are you tapping into, you know, expressing your desires uh, yeah. in, in, in the language of those different properties, right? Um, and how are you sort of doing it in a way that um, everything has a type, you know, so there is no random Python lambdas uh, flying around. Um, and you have a very clear path from whatever you cook up in your notebook, right, to actually launching stuff. Because, yeah, I, I think that's going to be sort of important this year is to, um, you know, everybody talks about getting things to production and, um, and not everybody is very clear on what that means, you know, does the responsibility of the vendor kind of stop at you being able to build a Docker container, uh, or is it sort of reasonable to expect that you will get help, you know, setting up all the resources in your, in your cloud, for example, which I, I believe it is, um, you know, if I give you a Docker container, you still have to figure out like all the serving uh, issues, right? Backfills, uh, how do you like share the workflow? Um, 
you know, how are you connecting this to the destinations? Because, you know, as, as we kind of established, there is the compute and the indexing or management of the vectors, right? And so that means we, we, we work with the vector databases to make the overall offering better, right? And so now it also has to reflect all the sort of production implications of what the vector database wants out of the workflow, right? Like, are you dropping a million vectors in it all at once and have it, you know, is the re-indexing parallelized? Like, all, all of those considerations there um, are part of the part of the problem. And then you have, you know, you have the batch and you have the real-time kind of use cases, right? Um, yeah. So, so yeah, but there, is a, there is a lot around that whole kind of... Um, start in a notebook and then get it to production. The get it to production, people kind of gloss over it, um, but it's, it's a lot of work, right? Yeah. We know that. Definitely know that. So what does it actually look like in practice when you're setting up a system? How do, how do you have like a vector compute deal or communicate with a vector database? And all the other pieces, like the embedding model and then the LLM and everything else, mm -hmm. if you're doing some kind of rag. If it's a Rexus, I can imagine it's a little bit different of a system design. So maybe you can break down those two and how you see the vector compute or the vector engine. What are you calling it? I don't even know. Is it a vector engine? Is it a vector compute engine? Is there a word yet? So we call it the vector computer and we kind of okay. take it to the computer place just to you know illustrate that the uh, uh, there will be electricity spent on a CPU slash a GPU type situation, um, and yeah, right. So, so in terms of kind of how does this look when you just want to solve the problem, just build a rack system that actually returns reasonable results, right? This is what everybody wants, um, and you know the the sort of the end goal here should be something like you know you go to your cloud provider. Uh, a a anyone you choose and these people have marketplaces right and that's where you al already probably provisioned your vector database unless you have one of the managed solutions which is also fine right but but you yeah. know for for many people they go to their cloud they provision their uh, whatever uh, xyz uh, database um, and and then it's just running there you know you kind of pay through the same billing account and, and then the, the same way you should be getting your vector compute uh, sort of uh, system, right? You should be pointing it on one hand at the vector database for all the uh, vector keeping, vector indexing needs, right? And you should be pointing it at where the data comes from, right? Because um, as we said, right, if you, if you, let's say you are a marketplace with houses, you know all kinds of things about those houses, right? Um, and those this data lives in different systems, right? Um, so, you know, there are data warehouses, there are databases, there is kind of the blob storage uh, where you might have other types of features that you compute with some other system. Um, typically, you know, there is kind of, I like to separate this uh, compute problem from ETL. Um, so I like to think about it as kind of ETL is getting the data from outside of your system to your system, right? So you pull it from your mail teams and from your, you know, uh, CRM and uh, all of those million different places. I think the modern data stack kind of movement last couple of years uh, pushed forward the idea that, okay, you should somehow like pull from all these different tools and centralize it and somehow organize it uh, in your core infrastructure. And it could still mean a few databases, but, you know, it's like some something sane. Um, and and then, you know, compute problems, any kind of machine learning workload should kind of start from those core pieces of the infra and, and take it from there, right? So um, that, that's why I usually say kind of ETL is kind of the step one. And then any kind of pipelines, model training, uh, all of that uh, work is kind of on top of it. And then you mentioned one also important thing, which is kind of the model inference. Uh, so, so normally you have this kind of train infer loop, right? And with the language models now, maybe that uh, should be renamed to like fine tune infer, right? Um, so, so but there is usually kind of some some 
Samsad loop. Um, and yeah, like you have to figure out when you are building your own uh, ve you know, vector computer, um, you have to figure out, okay, where are we running the models and how are we making those, let's say, inference services accessible from our pipelines, right? This is the, this is the kind of, uh, this is where the rubber hits the road, basically, right? We have some uh, Kafka streams coming in, we have some uh, Spark pipelines uh, shoveling data around. And somehow from those pipelines and all of those workers in those pipelines, we have to either run the models on the same uh, nodes or we have to create an inference um, service that we call from those pipelines and then like caching and, you know, not embedding things multiple times or actually re-embedding things when the model version changes. Right? This is kind of then the intersection of kind of data engineering and uh, I guess uh, machine learning engineering, right? So... Um, those are some of the things you have to think about when you build a uh, vector computer. Yeah. I gotta tell you, man, cause I'm not sure how I feel about the vector computer <laughs> name, uh, but you said so many incredible things in the last five minutes. I'm going to let it slide. All right. But the <laughs> vector computer, we're going to have to think about a different <laughs> cause it's I'm not sure it has that uh, that spiciness, that touch that I'm looking for, but whatever. Who am I to tell you how to do your thing? So, You're the marketing <laughs> guy. You, know, you tell me. I, I'm just an engineer and, trying to, you know, uh, yeah. uh, get by here. <laughs> There's so much incredible stuff that it's doing. I wish the name could encompass that more than uh, computer, vector computer, but we'll figure that out. Maybe by the time this airs, we'll have a different name for it and I'll put it in the, the beginning as like an addem, addendum, however you pronounce that word. So, okay, there's there's a lot to unpack there though when it comes to everything that you just said and uh, I'm going to try and just go through it in my head where it's like, all right, yeah, you have the ETL that comes through where you're grabbing all this data from outside, you're throwing it into whatever your S3 buckets, your data warehouses, all that fun stuff. There's nothing new there when it comes to ETL. I think everybody's fairly familiar with that. Then you have the data in your ecosystem. And from there, you're going to be taking that data and throwing it at the vector computer so that the vector computer can create different, and, and you're not creating embeddings from this, like the embedding piece is a whole different area. You're taking the data and you're creating embeddings in a different route. Like, can you break down how does this work with embedding yeah. models and all that fun stuff? Yeah. So you are taking everything you know about the entity that you want to process, right? Is so but if it's your user, then it's all their behavioral data, all their metadata, um, everything you know, right? Um, and you are somehow either training a custom embedding model that can eat all of those different types of data that you have about your user and produce the perfect vector that encodes everything you know about them, right? Um, so you either do a custom model and then, you know, you bring out your PyTorch to create all the layers that can process, you know, your feature engineer because... Some of these inputs will be like variable length, click sequences and whatever, right? So you, you either build a custom model and then you uh, you give it some sort of objective uh, for, for a downstream task and then kind of back propagate the error and, you know, the typical kind of machine learning work that we, that we all do. Um, or, or you find, let's say on the opposite extreme, you have your language model serving in some inference uh, service in your own cloud or you use one of the you know, providers that can help you serve uh, open source model, let's say. And and that's where, unfortunately, people stringify everything they know about the user and send it to the language model and make the vector that way, right? Um, Those prompt templates. Yeah. Yes. So, so I think, you know, like uh, in an ideal scenario, you have figured out the way to reconcile those two worlds, right? Because there will be some bits of text that you have on your user, right? And so for those, using some sort of, uh, you know, language uh, encoder um, uh, is, is, is a good idea, right? Because this has been pre-trained on a lot of data, it's good, right? So, so for those isolated bits and pieces of text, if you have some way to put 
some framework around that that doesn't require you to first flatten all the string bits together, but somehow keep it you know separate. Um, it's it's a good idea to use a language model, right? But for for some of the other stuff, yeah, you might need an uh, image embedding, you might need a graph embedding, you might need a time series embedding. Maybe you just want to encode the timestamp, but then do it in a way that when you do cosine similarity afterwards, it's like a time delta calculation, which is like whole another kind of math uh, puzzle. Um, so, so you know, long story short, you are collecting from your internal data infrastructure everything you know about an entity. And you want to have some process that runs through all of the instances of that entity and turns them into vectors that describe, that encode and compress all your organizational knowledge. Because then when you do retrieval on top of that thing, or when you do any kind of modeling on top of it, the input will be as rich as possible, right? You have the highest chance to actually make this thing to, to work. So, so that's sort of the goal. So I'm starting to wrap my head around it. And excuse me for taking a little bit longer than expected on this because I was too caught up with the name and I wasn't focusing on the actual important part. Uh, but the idea here then, if I'm understanding it as you're saying, being able to fine tune an embedding model is a superpower and it's very important when it comes to rags. So let's just take rags as an example, right? And so you want to make sure that that fine tuned model is as accurate as possible. The way that you can make it more accurate is by creating the right pipelines with the data coming from, so it gets ETL'd, then it's in your data warehouse or S3 bucket, whatever. Then you're going to create a pipeline. It's going to go through the vector compute and it's going to be used because the vector compute is able to weigh what's important, what's not. And then you're able to fine tune an, an embedding model off the back of that in the pipeline, kind of looking at it sequentially. I mean, that's like, we're getting there. We're getting there. Um. <laughs> keep it going then. Keep it, yeah, tell me where I'm wrong. Tell me what. Uh... So it was all correct, except one, one aspect, which is when you make this vector for your user, um, think about it as a problem of just kind of collecting all the available information, but not yet putting in the biases. So you want kind of raw vector. You want you want the vector that encodes everything you know about the user, but kind of normalizes the components so that at the inference time or at the, you know, when you actually do the querying, for example, right? Here, inference time is funny because is it the inference of the embedding model in the ingestion pipeline? Or is it the inference when you actually query uh, and you want to have your rack system answer a question, right? So yeah, the when, end when, user. It, uh, when, when, when we talk about the sort of like end inference, right? So we are training a model on top of the vector. We are uh, doing retrieval on top of the vector. That's the time when you want to start playing with those biases, right? Because then you can A-B test, you can be kind of uh, fast and nimble. You can converge to biases that, uh, uh, you know, hit the sweet spot for your different for example, screens where you display the recommendations, all of that stuff, right? So that, that you want that to happen as late as possible. Yeah, yeah. And then in terms of the vector formation, you know, how do I make thousand float numbers that encode everything I know about my user or my, my document chunk or, you know, house uh, or, or whatever? You want to index these vectors into your vector database, but you want to make them not opinionated at all. Right. So somehow you want to normalize the strength to which all these different parts uh, contribute. Right. Do you care about freshness or do you care about relevance? Well, 50 50. That's the index. Right. And then, and then when it comes time to, okay, we have the new page. Okay. So there we want to boost uh, freshness. Right. We have the for you page. Okay. A little bit more relevance. Right. This is a concern that happens kind of uh, at the, you know, final moment of just pulling the data together and uh, putting it in front of the user or, you know, clustering your machines in manufacturing, like, okay, in this moment, in this context, which machines will break, right? And and that's the time to put in the, the biases. All, all the way up to then, you just want to take everything about your machine and 
boil it down to to the vector to just encode all your observations in kind of a uh, impartial way, let's say. Yeah. Okay. And so then the the vector computer comes in in that last moment to make sure that it weighs out everything properly? It, both in the ingestion and in the last moment. So Adam, basically hey. our component uh, basically works with the vector database both for the ingestion and for the retrieval. Um, and, and, you know, then for the using the vectors as the uh, feature vectors, so you are training another model on top of the output of the vector computer. Um, that model can uh, learn its own uh, set of biases, right? So in that uh, workflow, um, in, in that workflow, you 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 don't necessarily need the vector computer anymore. But what will happen is that the model that uses the vector as an input instead of click sequences for users will be much simpler, right? So now you have. Now you have this model that you are training on labels and vectors. And, you know, like a floating point vector is, you know, it's uh, mwah, for a language model, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's exactly what it wants to eat, right? Okay, so then if I'm understanding this, again, I'm just going to keep, like, throwing it back at you to make sure I understand because I really want to wrap my head around it. And I think I'm there, but I'm not sure if I'm fully there. So feel free to correct me again. The reason you're flattening it out is because you want the vector computer to do all the heavy lifting. You want all of this to be as flat as possible so that later you can add in some kind of logic in the vector computer and let that give you the control that you were talking about before. Yes, yes. All right. It's maybe, it's maybe like you take a raw photo, right? That's like a bit yeah. kind of grayish, right? Like, like underexposed or whatever they say, right? It's like, uh, you know, it kind of looks boring. But it preserves the most information, right? It preserves the most information about the scene, and then and then it depends. Okay, do I want this for uh, wedding? Do I want this for social? Right? You like push the curves this way, that way, uh, and, and that's kind of the ingestion and the the. Okay, I'll, I'll use this uh, a meme uh, for my next link. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. That is perfect because now I understand. It's like I want to capture as much information as possible. And then I want to be able to do what I will with it. However, I like to show p that information to people. I yeah. should be able to turn the knobs in the way that I want to turn the knobs. And then it gets outputted in something that I'm happy with. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. Okay. All right. So now it's starting to come together for me where I'm seeing, yes, this is giving you more control because you're making the decisions with the vector compute as opposed to what you would traditionally see in the RAG pipelines or even Rexis, and it's like just going straight from the vector database. And maybe you've got your embedding model that throws the embeddings into the vector database and then the retrieval, and it goes to the LLM. And maybe what goes to the LLM is right, maybe it's not. And you've also got your prompt templates. And so now what you're saying is before the embeddings go to the LLM, they're hitting the vector compute. And then the vector compute is turning the knobs to say, this is more important, this is less important. And we feed it to the LLM in the way that we want. It's like our secret recipe now. Yeah, exactly. And very importantly, in that sort of progression that you mentioned, um, when you, at the query time, you are, for example, learning or, or A-B testing what's actually important for my use case, you don't just use that to reorder the candidates that you already retrieved, right? This is, this is the, one of the problems that exists in the space is that people do that initial retrieval kind of dumb, kind of uh, heuristic, right? Throw in a some hybrid search, uh, do just kind of like simple embedding of the query and see what, what gives on the, on the text embeddings uh, that come back. And then they try to be clever about, okay, let's reorder this thing to match whatever objective we have. But now you are reordering 0.1% of your database, right? Uh, you have retrieved a small fraction of all the stuff you have, and now you are trying to be smart on top of that. 
the obvious problem with that is that, you know, there is like all the vendor stuff in your index that maybe you didn't even surface, right? And so when you at the query time, when you are deciding, okay, freshness, is this important? Popularity, this important? Relevance, this important? It's important to express that in a way that it informs the underlying retrieval, not just I will retrieve thousand things and then I'll have my sort of uh, kind of linear combination uh, little model that figures out the preferences and then I'll reorder um, because that misses kind of the point. So, you know, this kind of uh, retrieval time vector computer objective is to express these, these different goals and then formulate the search vector such that when you go and do the nearest neighbor search in the vector database, you are already in that sort of step boosting certain aspects and so on and finding the globally optimal set of items that have the right trade-off between how far is the house, how big is the house, you know, uh, is the like price history similar to how is that clicked on before, da 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 right? Like you need to be able to yeah, express this. How old this. is the ad? Yeah. Yeah, and, and send it to the index, right? And then the index should be globally finding you the 10 houses that already kind of fulfill that combination of objectives. And then you just return it to the user, right? So at the start of this conversation, we talked about how, you know, our objective for a couple of years was to eliminate the need for the re-ranking by making the underlying search smarter. So, well, this is how that works, right? That you kind of express the objective, we construct the the search vector in a way that that's where the boosting happens. So that when you send it to the nearest neighbor index in the in the vector database, uh, it's it's already doing that kind of uh, opinionated combination of factors, right? And the underlying search is cosine similarity. We, we don't have, I, I don't think you need sort of like special uh, scoring functions in the index itself because that's uh, that's slow, right? You have to be building an index without user-defined functions that you know, readily goes well. Um, and so you need some way to do this with like vanilla, uh, you know, nearest neighbor search with cosine or dot product or something. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's possible. Like, uh, you know, we, we, we have been discussing like a hypothetical system uh, so far, uh, but, but, you know, like, uh, uh, the, the, the company is, uh, is is building so super linked uh, is, is building uh, this, this this vector computer actually by the time this goes live um, we might have sort of done the the initial kind of public release already so um, there we yeah. go just so putting that out everybody there. go to what superlink dot ai or com? dot com all right Dude. Like we are serious Why you give here. me that look? <laughs> For everybody just listening, he just gave me the <laughs> biggest mean mug ever for saying dot AI. No, no. What's this well, about? We, we have AI as well, I think. Uh, but, but yeah. Oh, even better. So you can go to superlink.ai and get redirected to superlink.com. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah. So I'll, I'll for check anyone after, that... we, after the recording. Yeah. But uh... Okay. We'll I, cut it out yeah, if you don't. Yeah. People should... Uh, People should go to superlinked.com and uh, you know le learn you know uh, learn about uh, our ways of building vector computers. Um, but yeah, I think this will be like a whole another field, right? So you should also kind of you know hopefully we kind of covered different ideas for how you can build a vector computer of your own. And I think for some people that that definitely might make sense. Um, we have been thinking about this for a while and, you know, we're happy to, to chat and kind of, uh, share what we learned and, uh, uh, maybe just, uh, sort of like, as we come up on the, on the wrap up, um, maybe it's where, don't go uh, anywhere yet. I still got so many questions for you. Do you have a hard stop? Uh, you do. I, I can go, you I can go a little thing. bit over time. Okay. I, I can give what it 10, you 10 minutes. <laughs> oh man. All right. Then speak fast, man. You talked about speed. Yeah, yeah. How does uh, it, what have you seen when it comes to speed? Like, does this speed things up? Does this slow things down because it's one more step? Is it negligible? Uh, you have to do this step anyway. You have to turn your data into vectors. Um, and typically the language model, which, you know, uh, is kind of taking the brand of these workloads right now, is the 
biggest possible model that you can be using to turn data into vectors. Uh, there's for different types of data, there are specialized models that do it uh, much more efficiently. You know, if you uh, train, uh, let's say, graph embedding uh, for for the graph nodes to encode the structure, um, it is much smaller model than uh, than a language model. So, um, actually, kind of. Uh, you know, only using language model where you absolutely have to, and then using specialized models is kind of one of the things of how you make all these systems more efficient. Uh, so it's definitely there is there is a part of that. Um, being reasonable around the infrastructure, how you organize the pipelines, is the model collocated with the pipeline workers, or is it a separate service? You know, you, know, you need people thinking about that that type of stuff when you build this uh, yourself. Um, that's where the gains come from right um so yeah i think for for like if you have a scale of kind of uh, single millions or maybe low tens of millions of data points your main problem will be how do we experiment right how do we uh sort of you know try different uh ingestion policies and and query policies in some environment where we can eyeball or throw things in front of a user quickly iterate right Step one, and then step two, yeah, like how do we run the backfill? How do we get the service to be reliably running in our in our cloud? And how do we manage the lifecycle of the underlying vector database? These are kind of like basic concerns, but there is a bunch of moving pieces, right? Uh, and and then and and you don't like really care that much about uh, you know okay for every one model run. You know how many milliseconds per vector does it take, right? It's more the just kind of covering all the bases of the process and, and just kind of getting good at the launching things. Um, and then when it goes to sort of like hundred million plus data points, that's where um, you you really start to care about okay, are we set, uh, serving this model as efficiently as we can, right? And you know each cloud now has some managed uh, language model serving offerings or there third parties um, and so then it starts to make sense but you know just to give you some like specific number a100 for reasonably small chunks of text uh, with a reasonable embedding model can make thousands of vectors per second so uh, this is uh, this is, uh, this is doable uh, and it's not going to be with the GPT-4 or with like uh, Llama 2 uh, but but you know Everybody knows the massive embedding table, and on that table you can find models that have one or two hundred uh, megabytes, basically. Um, and then, yeah, those are those are fast. Sweet. So there is something else that I wanted to call out, which I think is worth everyone that is listening go and check out some of the great work that you're doing, with Vector Hub, too. If they haven't seen it already, if anyone wants to compare vector databases you've done a great job because you have no dog in the fight basically i i really like that you're vector compute so you don't have to worry about the vector databases you're compatible with all vector databases i imagine and that gives you a nice position to be like okay here's what each vector database does and doesn't do and here's a table so that if anyone wants to see what vector databases do what then they can go to vectorhub.ai.com. Super, dot com. super uh, linked. No, no, it's it's uh, hub. Oh god, superlinked. I got it so wrong. We'll leave it in the show notes. <laughs> hub hub dot uh, dot com is, is for the vector hub where we have uh, wow. basically contributor uh, provided um, deep dives on information retrieval with vectors, right? So Rexis, semantic search, rag. Um, how to do this stuff in browser, in production, you know, uh, we try to be quite practical and a uh, little bit advanced, right? Like not your totally basic thing, a um, l- little bit more advanced tricks and, and tips. Um, and so that's the vector hub, hub.superlink.com. Uh, and then, yeah, we have basically partnered with, with uh, the, the different vendors in the vector database space um, to try and map out uh, the 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 different offerings, right? Um, for this is like one of the problems that we hear when we chat with new folks coming into the space is they're trying to wrap their head around, okay, when do I use what? 
right? When which yeah. one is good for you know if I have many small indices or few big indices or how does the pricing work with that or you know is it running bundled with my own app or is there a managed offering or which hybrid search features right so so we have basically for 36 or so different vendors uh we have a list of something like 30 different features and then what we try to do with the with the vendors is not just say okay the database supports the feature or partially supports it but also link to the documentation for that specific feature, right? So when you are kind of learning about the space and you are, you know, you care about certain things, uh, it's very easy to go and see, okay, which database supports the functionality I need and then go to the documentation to kind of double check, does this actually mean what I think it means? Um, and, and you know, the, the vendors kind of send us, it's, it's baked by uh, GitHub. Uh, so it's a GitHub repo with JSON files for each, for each vendor and the vendors send us pull requests to keep the data up to date. So this has been, yeah, work, working working quite well. Um, and it gave us a way to kind of chat with all these people and, you know, build a, build a relationship as well. So as you said, you know, we don't have a horse uh, in the race. Um, it's just that we need databases that, that work well and that people, yeah. uh, you know, are kind of comfortable with. And um, for us, that made total sense to kind of put together the data set and just help everybody understand this a bit better. So lucky for you, you get to benefit from the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been invested into vector databases in the last year because you can partner with all of them. So just jump on those marketing trains and get after it. Yeah, exactly. And and in some way, help them uh, deliver on that kind of uh, overarching promise, right? So, also, so you know, just uh, basically... Um, everybody is excited about deep learning based uh, retrieval and uh, feature engineering work, right? This is the uh, um, top of mind for people and a lot of the sort of materials out there make it look super easy, right? So you can just, you know, um, run something through OpenAI and uh, the retrieval quality will happen. Um, and then in practice, folks get into these projects and it takes quarters to get something like really, really working. Um, and we want to sort of uh, remove that, that disappointment, right? So like everybody's excited uh, and we want to keep the happy train going and people launching systems. Um, and I think, yeah, it, it's going to take both of those pieces of the puzzle, the, the compute and the, the, the vector indexing and management. Um, and those parts have to work together basically. So that's, that's, what do we want to do? Well, I love what you're doing. I also want to call out that it's not just for rags, right? Like, I think we made it pretty clear, but just to reiterate that anyone doing anything that deals with embeddings, which of course, recommender systems are huge when it comes to that. And that is more of a traditional ML type of system as opposed to the LLM type system. This vector compute feels like it is also really interesting for that and it yeah. can help your system perform better yeah and then another kind of big one that we didn't really discuss that much is analytics uh you know you want to find customers that behave similarly you want to find the uh, your, your machines in a factory that will break at the same time uh, so doing kind of clustering on top of these vectors or training other models or just doing, hey, show me similar, uh, you know, products that sell similarly, you know, uh, things like that. Um, you know, I think by the end of this year, you know, if we do a, a good job on partnerships, uh, people will be doing these kind of queries in their business intelligence and they will not necessarily know that actually they run a kind of super linked uh, workload under the hood. Um, but they will be tapping into the this kind of dream of uh, deep learning based uh, retrieval, right? Um, that's the goal is kind of make it accessible to as many people as possible when they already work today, right? So the hype is awesome, but uh, you know, I I, uh, I I really love to work with uh, folks who have the ordinary problems and they just want to get their job done and kind of meeting them uh, there, right? Yeah. Oh man. That's so cool. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. I love what 
you are working on. I appreciate you coming on here and explaining it to me like I'm five. I know it took a little bit longer to get it, especially because this is like the second or third time that I've talked to you about it, which I didn't want to mention that while we were talking about it. I should know by now, but I was just, you know, uh, going a little slower so that all the listeners out there could go stay with me. And yeah, hopefully... so we brought everybody along. Uh, exactly. Yes. <laughs> I wish it was like that, man. A, a bit of a baseball <laughs> moment for me. But I will we, say... We got I, there. We got there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, hopefully. I, I do have a better understanding. I will encourage everyone that is listening to this if you're interested in it go to superlink.com also if you want to partner with daniel and the superlink team get after it and make sure that you hit them up now because dude i think you all are going to blow up i will say that right now i'm going to call it and i i really hope so all right thanks a lot uh, for having me and uh, it has been a pleasure to dive into these uh, esoteric topics of uh, vector embeddings and uh, yeah see, see you around in the community and on, on the upcoming event there we go